All right, welcome everyone to our Nature's Notebook webinar, all about how your data have been used this year. Um, thank you so much for coming. We, um, I'm Erin Postumis. I'm the Outreach Coordinator here at the USA National Phenology Network, and I'm here with Dr. Teresa Crimmins, who's going to be walking us through some recent studies that have used your data. Um, before we get started, we would love for you to test out the chat for us and let us know where you're calling in from. And if you'd like to say anything about any phenology happenings where you are, we always love to hear those as well. And as you can see, we are recording this webinar. We'll be posting the recording on our YouTube channel after the webinar is done. And we'll also send out an email following the webinar that'll have the link in it in case you wanna look at it later. And uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar. So feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. Um, we'll have everyone stay muted while we're giving you the information today, but definitely wanna hear from you at the end. So we can invite you to unmute or you can just put your questions in the chat and we'll get to those at the end. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Teresa Kermans, who is our director of the USA National Phen Phenology Network here. Thanks so much, Erin. <clears throat> and yes, as Erin indicated, what we'll be covering today is just a few of the growing examples of who uses the phenology data that you contribute and why. So I wanna start, of course, as always, with a huge thank you to all of you for being here today and to every one of you that contribute uh, observations of phenology. We're so grateful for every single record that comes in because it makes the work that we do possible. It makes the kinds of um, results and, and, and studies that I'm gonna to cover today possible. Without those observations on the ground, we wouldn't have a phenology network and we wouldn't have insights into how things are um, interacting and changing um, and what, what influences phenology. <clears throat> so I'd love to just take a quick moment and hear about who we have on the call. This will help me gauge um, how much detail to go into basically. Erin's uh, gonna launch a poll question for us quickly here to just get a sense of who all on the call actually is a Nature's Notebook contributor because we have, um, we have lots of folks who are actively involved. <clears throat> um, I think at last count, oh, I should check. I should have checked the numbers. I don't know if we've topped 3000 folks yet this year, but in total, since our program launched in 2009, I think we're close to 20,000 folks across the country have contributed data at one point or another. So it looks like, yeah, today we've got um, over three quarters of the of, of you are, uh, that are on the call are Nature's Notebook folks. So thank you again so much. And for those of you that haven't yet signed up, please know that we have Hello. fantastic support. Hi there. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Are you on the phone? Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm here. I've got a Nature's Notebook webinar right now. Okay, I'm going to mute. For those of you that are not yet Nature's Notebook uh, participants, please know <laughs> that we have amazing support and we are so happy to help you through um, the intricacies, the, the, the different steps of getting going if you need that. Oh, oops, did we not share that there? Apologies, I'm, we've been doing webinars for years now and I still don't always get the controls just right. Okay, so just as a brief reminder, I think pretty much everyone here is aware that the purpose of the USA National Phenology Network, the why, why we were established back in 2007, is to basically be a repository for information about when plants and animals are undergoing different seasonal events. We collect, we store, and we readily share phenology data and information. And we make that available to be able to support advancements in our fundamental understanding <clears throat> of the science of phenology. And then also to support a lot of different kinds of decisions in both natural resource management, things like invasive species management, or um, better understanding at the start and the peak of the allergy season. As, as well, we also communicate and connect about phenology, and we are working on growing, creating and growing, hopefully, an equitable and inclusive network. So our intent is that the work that we do benefits everybody in the country. So I'm just going to launch right into today, we're going to cover four different studies, recent studies that have been published, 
that show that 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 utilize and um, wouldn't be possible without the the phonology data that have been contributed by members of Nature's Notebook. So without further ado, here are some of the ways in which the phonology data that you collect are used. Um, if you've attended webinars that we've given in the past, these slides, some of these will look familiar. Um, what I like to try to do is give you um, some context. Some of them, the phonology observations are used in a, in a lot of different types of applications. However, there are some ways in which they are used commonly. <clears throat> and one of those ways is depicted by the image on the left, which is to under, better understand what are the local conditions that need to be present in order for a species to actually undergo a phenological event. And so what I mean by that is you're probably aware, I'm sure that you've noticed, even if you weren't really paying attention, um, that in the springtime, we start to see leaves and flowers come out on plants once it starts getting warmer. And it's, it's a, typically a function of once the days start getting longer, and then that drives <clears throat> temperature. And once the, temp the air temperature starts to increase, the plants and insects and animals start to respond by coming out of hibernation and starting to burst their little buds. We don't actually know for a lot of species specifically what the conditions are though. Um, what you might've noticed too, is that not all of the species put on their leaf buds or their flowers at the same time. We have certain species that are among the earliest. We see the crocus and the daffodils bursting up even when there's usually still snow on the ground, but we don't see oaks starting to put on their little leaf buds until much later, many weeks later into the season. Why is that? Well, those, those different species have different requirements for the conditions that they have to be um, exposed to in order to actually start undergoing those springtime phenological events. And so one of the ways that our data are used is in trying to understand with more specific, um, with more specificity, what are those conditions that actually lead to the buds breaking and the, the leaf shoots coming out? And then another common way that we see these data are being used is in documenting how the timing of events like leaf out is changing now. And so that's what we're showing on the in the image on the right. And the first example that I'm going to talk about is one of those kinds of studies where the observations that have been contributed are being used, have been used to better understand how the timing of leaf out and flowering has changed pretty dramatically in a number of species in New York state. So this is a pretty incredible set of data, honestly. Um, <clears throat> an individual by the name of Conrad Vispo, based at the um, Hawthorne Ecological Center in, in upstate New York, <clears throat> a few years ago, happened across these documents that were unknown to many of us, to, to him and many, many others, I think. They were just kind of lost in the dusty archives. The New York State Regents back in the early 1800s starting tra started tracking both meteorological and phenological observations at a whole bunch of academic institutions across the state. Um, and this was mainly for the purpose of better understanding when to plant. It was really intended for agricultural applications, um, but they, you know, folks had noticed, well, when it's colder, um, plants stay dormant. When it's warmer, we start to see things warming up or, or fruits ripening. How can we use that kind of information to better inform what to plant and where and when we might harvest it? And pretty incredibly, they took really detailed, repeated, consistent observations on a lot of different species, um, both leaf out and flowering, and I think even fruit ripening, as well as temperature and precipitation and, and, and some of your standard meteorological observations um, very regularly for several decades. In the 1850s, it was shifted to the Smithsonian and persisted, um, though it was interrupted by the Civil War, which just blows my mind that you know, we had phonology observations occurring in a really rigorous manner well before the Civil War. Um, the, the effort was finally ended at the, in the late 1800s and sat dormant in these archives that looked something like this <clears throat> until very recently when Conrad discovered that and brought it forward to um, a woman named Carissa Fuchilla Battle, who some of you might know, she um, leads the New York Phonology Project or program, which is a collection of 
local phonology networks or local phonology projects established in New York State um, that have been tracking phonology for many years. And so in this study, what Carissa and Conrad and I and several others did was compare those observations that had been contributed back in the 1800s to what's been documented for the same species here in New York in recent times. So we ended up uh, comparing historical observations that ranged from 1826 to 1872 to current contemporary, which was 2009 through 2017. We were able to line up observations for 36 different species of plants, 11 forbs or, or small flower kind of things, 13 small trees and shrubs, and then 12 tree species. And you can see on the map all of the different locations where those data were collected. The data that we used for comparing the timing of leaf out and flowering um, was contributed by hundreds, if not thousands of, of awesome, amazing, <laughs> dedicated individuals. Uh, the organizations that we ended up summarizing data from for the study are reflected here. So hopefully we have some represent representatives from some of these groups on this call. And then I didn't want to put individuals' names, but what we what we kept track of was the hometown, the town uh, associated with the site for individual observers. And so if you were an individual observer, um, rather than being associated with a local phonology network, you might see your local um, municipality mentioned on here. Again, thank you. The study revealed some pretty dramatic shifts. What these plots are showing is the average difference in the timing of leaf out and flowering for the different species in days. So the, 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 the x-axis shows days. The length of the bar is indicating on average how much earlier. So notice that these are all negative numbers, which means that things have advanced. They have gotten earlier since the, since the 1800s. And in some cases, we are looking at up to four weeks or more earlier. So Quercus alba, which is white oak, is on average er leafing out, I think that's probably about 28 days earlier than it was in the 1800s. Um, on average, when we looked across all of those different species, I think it was a advancement of 10 days on average for leaf out. And then, or I'm sorry, it was 15 days for leaf out and then 10 days for flowering. Um, and as you can see, pretty much everybody shifted to earlier. Uh, Prunus serotina, which is a cherry, is the only one that's showing maybe, maybe some squishier um, results there. We've got our error bar drifting over, hanging off into the, into the positive here. So it's not as big of an advancement. But basically, this is showing that everybody moved their timing toward earlier and not just by a little, but by a lot. Um, and what was pretty neat in this study is because we had so many different species, we were also, and so many locations represented, we were able to look to see were those changes different um, in rural versus urban areas, among insect versus wind pollinated plants, among plants that leafed out or, or, or flowered early in the season versus later in the season, and then among those different functional types. And we saw the, we saw greater advancement in the timing of leaf out and flowering for plants in urban areas over rural, which is, it makes sense. Urban areas tend to be warmer than rural and by and large temperature was the, the reason why we saw the advancement. And so we see even greater advancement in those, in those more urban areas because of that urban heat island effect. We saw a greater advancement among insect pollinated plants versus wind pollinated. And that's kind of a novel finding, honestly. That's not something, not a dimension that's typically evaluated in these studies. So that, that's pretty significant and neat. Um, we saw more advancement among early season plants versus the later season plants. That's consistent with what a lot of other studies have shown already too. And then finally, we saw the greatest advancements among the trees versus the forbs and the, the shrubby things. And that has some interesting implications um, that has been explored in other studies where if you are seeing tree canopies putting on their leaves earlier, earlier in the year and they're showing greater advancement than the understory canopy plants, that can have implications for those understory canopy plants because they are no longer able to get the light resources and other nutrients that they are they used to be able to get before the tree canopy closed. Okay, shifting gears now to one of the studies that instead 
starts to look at what are the drivers to phenology. So these repeat observations like we cultivate in through nature's notebook where you're looking at you know, what's happening, hopefully on at least a weekly basis so you can establish precisely when something occurred. And then ideally <laughs> uh, making those observations for multiple years so you can see how things vary from year to year. That's really the best data, the, the, the most robust data that we can have for trying to establish what are the drivers to phenology? You know, it, how much temperature, how much warmth does a plant need to ex be exposed to? Is snow melt a factor? Um, is, is day length a factor? However, even though we have over 30 million records now that have been contributed to Nature's Notebook, in truth, that still is sparse when we're trying to establish these drivers. So one of the ways that we can increase the quantity of data that we have available to support our investigations is to expand, extend and expand that pool of data by pulling from other sources. And herbarium records are one of the best opportunities that we have for, for um, increasing that, that pool of data. And so in, for those of you that have not had the pleasure of visiting our, an herbarium, it's so lovely. It's like a library, but for plants. <laughs> what researchers do is collect plant samples and then press them to preserve them. Um, and as you can see on this example, there's an information card in the corner that indicates where and when it was collected. And typically samples are collected when plants, especially for, well, they are for plants, <laughs> they're not animals. Um, they are typically collected when they are in their reproductive phases, meaning flowering or fruiting or both, because that can give um, the most information for somebody who might want to reference that that sample for plant identification and comparing structures. And it also gives us an awesome opportunity to get a sense of when plants were in flower historically. And so I should have looked, but this example that I gave, yeah, it looks like it says 2020, that can't be right, 2004. So that's not very old, but we know that this particular hydrangea sample was in flower on September 11th in 2004 in Vermont. Um, wherever that, I can't quite read it, Washington County, maybe? Um, and so that's actually not only a sample of where and when, but it's where and when, and it was in flower too, and it looks like peak flower. And so what researchers have been able to do is digitize or um, take all these plant herbarium samples and turn them into digital records that can then be analyzed and compare those with the flowering records that have been collected on the ground through Nature's Notebook. And so these researchers uh, based out of UC Santa Barbara did that very thing. They, they wanted to evaluate, do we see similar conditions driving that look like they drive flowering when we look at the samples collected from herbarium records and from nature's notebook records? Because if so, that means that we can leverage herbarium records to ask even more um, complex questions about the drivers to phenology. And so in this study, not unlike the last one, it was, it was a matter of matching up what species do we have enough data for in both um, data sources where we can actually compare apples to apples. And so this map is showing um, the locations for which we had samples for, from the herbarium uh, records, and then it's the same set of species. And these are the samples where we had observations in the Na Nature's Notebook observation build data set. And you can kind of see the density of the records and the spatial distribution, um, but they're both represented. And so what the researchers did was basically look at the conditions as associated with flowering and compared how well those seem to align. And I'm not, I don't wanna go into the, into the, the details here, um, but basically what this plot is indicating is we have the day, this is just the day of year, the day of year that the flowering was observed for these different species on average as documented in the Nature's Notebook data set. And these numbers indicate the sequential day of year. So if you think of um, the whole year as you could number all of the days in the year from one to 365 or 366 in the case of a leap year. And so January 1st is day one and January 2nd is day two and then January 29th is day 29. And so what we're showing here is that where we see the different colored dots, 
indicates on average when those different species were documented as first being in flower um, as, as reported by Nature's Notebook observers. And then we can look at the same thing on the y-axis. That indicates the day of year that it looked like plants were in flower in those herbarium records. So for those pressed plant samples that had flowers on them for these different species, what day of year were those samples collected? And where species fall on the black line, that means that, um, actually, no, this is not a one-to-one -one line. If we were to draw a line from one corner of the graph to the other, um, that would be, if points fell on that line, that would mean that the day of year that was reported in these two data sets were exactly the same. This is actually a little bit off and I didn't catch that until right now. Some of the species um, look like they fall close to that line and others do not. It's actually a pretty darn good fit though. Um, the measure, the way we measure this fit is through this, this R value and 0.91 is pretty darn high. It's highly significant. And so what these researchers concluded was, yes, we can actually use these herbarium records to tell us more about when things occurred because they do tell us that things were in flower pretty much at about the same time that we see nature's notebook observers on the ground reporting these same phenomenon. So that's pretty cool because it opens up the door to a lot more research because uh, the, the suddenly the sample size is much, much larger if we can use herbarium records. Okay, staying on that thread of what drives things, we know that temperature matters. We know that um, temperature matters in a couple of different forms. We know that, temp that plants respond to how warm it's been. We know also though that a lot of plants in the springtime need to have been exposed to a, a certain amount of chill in the wintertime uh, before they start paying attention to the warmth so, so that they can be sure that they've gotten through the winter. And then another variable that matters quite a bit for many species is day length. Many species, again, thinking specifically about plants, but this does apply to animals too, a lot of them won't actually start paying attention to warmth until the days are a certain length. Meaning, um, as again, going back to kind of grade school, um, as the earth is rotating or revolving around the sun, remember that the earth is at an angle. And so that dictates that we have in the Northern hemisphere, short days in the winter, and then as we move around the sun, our days get longer until the a maximum at the solar, what's it called? God, I'm blanking, not the equinox, the other thing. <laughs> Solstice, um, the longest day. And then what we're actually approaching, we're, we're having our day lengths shrink again. Um, we're winding down toward the equinox again very soon. Um, is that tomorrow? Is that tomorrow? Maybe tomorrow. Thursday. 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 Yay. Okay. That means we have 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of, um, of darkness. It's exactly even. Okay. So plants care about the amount of day length. Um, a lot of plants do. Well, what about, what about the fact that we have an awful lot of lights on after it gets dark all across the country? Could that potentially have a impact on um, on plants phenology and when they start to leap out or when they end their phenology too because as the days start to get shorter as we are experiencing that actually does play a role in cueing plants to start to wind down their photosynthesis for the season and enter into the um, leaf senescence and leaf color change and leaf drop. So these researchers very cleverly investigated that. Um, they, they collected what you can kind of see on the under the underlaying map here uh, they use this satellite collected product that indicates um, nighttime where, where basically where it's dark or where it's bright at night. Um, and so you can easily pick up the, the cities, Phoenix and, and um, San Diego and LA down here and um, Houston and Dallas, um, because we've got, of course, tons and tons of, of artificial light occurring from those urbanized areas. What these researchers did was take that, that um, artificial light product and then overlay with it all of the different observations that we have for leaf, breaking leaf bud in nature's notebook for all of the species listed here. And then the same thing for colored leaves for a different suite of species, but overlapping um, all, of the, all across the country. And they basically looked to see was, the, was breaking leaf buds 
advanced? Did it occur earlier in, in locations with more artificial light that compared to more rural areas, darker areas? And then at the other end of the season, did we see an extension of the growing season in, um, in urbanized areas? Did the, did the leaves stay green longer in locations where there was artificial light? And indeed, it was a pretty darn clear pattern, honestly, where um, what this is depicting is the blue line is when uh, you have those leaves on the trees under less developed conditions. And then this orange line is where you have a more, more urbanized conditions and more artificial light. And it's, it's pulling that season out to be longer. And so you can see from this dotted line that it results in a, in a longer growing season. What the researchers uh, uh, investigated though and talk about in this paper that's pretty neat is that it's tough to disentangle um, this artificial light that is a factor that is a condition of urbanized areas from that additional warmth that we experience in, in urbanized areas. As I men mentioned before, um, more developed areas tend to be warmer than the rural counterparts simply because we've got more pavement that can, the, the dark um, parking lots, they, they bring in heat and they, they hold onto it and then they emit it over the nighttime. So you tend to have warmer nighttime temperatures in more developed areas. Um, and this is a, a significant urban heat island effect is becoming a, um, a, a, a increasingly important factor in, in indicating when plants and animals undergo these phenological transitions. What we do know from other studies is that that urban heat island effect is, is tending to advance phenology. And so we do see earlier leaf out and later leaf color change in urban areas because of that urban heat island effect. We also are seeing the effect of artificial light. What research has, what, what the researchers in this particular study are able to um, articulate is eventually, if we're looking, if we're thinking of just the warmth, as the planet continues to warm and those urban areas get increasingly warmer, eventually plants wouldn't be able to continue to advance their phenology in the spring because the days would be too short. However, if we have this additional um, artificial light in the form of all the, everybody's porch lights being on and, and street lights being on all night long, that actually helps the plants think it's even, it, it, it's um, not only, it, they can tolerate the warmer condition, conditions earlier in the year and they can tolerate it because the, the, the light is there as well. And so this artificial light, they hypothesize will enable plants to continue to advance their leaf out earlier into the year, especially in these um, urban areas and then delay the season end later. Um, especially in urban areas. And so, and so <laughs> we thought we used to think that of, you know, eventually plants will stop advancing their springtime because of that limitation. But this study indicates actually the addition of the light releases that constraint most, most likely. Okay, one more factor. What about precipitation? I haven't really talked about precipitation much. We have snow melt depicted on here. We have sea ice. Um, I should change this graph because we don't typically talk about sea ice a whole lot as drivers to phenology for plants. Um, but what we are gonna talk about here is rainfall. Um, it's generally not um, a uh, driver that gets a lot of attention. Mostly what gets the attention is the temperature. Um, and we've all seen dozens of headlines in the last several years, things like this one, abnormally warm spring expected or looks over the US. Um, blue bonnets arrive early in Texas and you can thank climate change for this bit of sunshine. Cherry blossoms coming earlier. Spring is getting warmer and starting sooner. Those are all hinting at the, the influence of increasing temperature. But what about precipitation? That must have a fat, that must play a role here too. By and large, when researchers look at the influence of precipitation or, or rainfall, um, it's usually at, in the form of totals, like how much rainfall does an area receive on average over the whole year or for a season, say winter or spring or, 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 or maybe at the scale of a month, but it's typically how much in total. And what has generally been documented is that 
if we have a wetter, especially a wetter winter, if we receive more precipitation overall, um, it can lead to a later spring. And the reasons for that are that you've got, if you've got more snowfall, there's more energy that has to be added to the system to melt it. And then, and at the same time, all of that white ground surface is reflecting the sunlight away. And so it slows that warming in the season, in the spring season. And so if we have a wet winter, it tends to lead to a later spring. And conversely, a drier winter can lead to an earlier spring. But that's not very nuanced. Um, another way that we could think about this is in the form of the number of rainfall events. And so in this study, these researchers looked at, this is not the loveliest map, I will admit. <laughs> We're looking down at the North Pole here, and this is North America. Um, and then this is Europe here and um, Southeast Asia, I guess, over here. Um, the dots indicate where we have observations of leaf out and flowering. And in the United States, the researchers only focused on locations with at least 15 years of observations. And so in the US that really kind of um, negates the opportunity to involve most nature's notebook observations. All we've really got that have records that long are our historical observations of lilacs and honeysuckles. Uh, but there were a number of locations where we had those data. And so these researchers looked across the Northern hemisphere how much influence does the number of rainfall events have on the timing of springtime phenology? And what they identified here um, was that when you have fewer rainfall events, it tends to lead to advanced leaf out. And I'm not, I won't go into a lot of detail because this is a fairly complicated study, but one important takeaway here is that these, this is an example of the kind of analysis where having repeat observations for a long duration, what feels impossibly long for those of us who are collecting, making the observations on the ground are so important. And so um, we're so grateful for those of you that have persisted and collect, continue to collect observations after, you know, year after year. Everything is valuable. And as you can see from the previous studies, sometimes it doesn't matter. If you only have observations for one year at a location that can be used in a lot of ways in other kinds of applications, it's really important to have those repeated observations collected year on year after year. One thing I wanted to mention, uh, because this is following up on something we mentioned the last time in our springtime webinar, is that we have tried to keep track, we do try to keep track of all the different ways that the data are used. Uh, and there's so many examples that it's impossible to talk about them all in a single webinar now. It would take many hours. But one of the things that we did recently was publish a, a manuscript that describes some of these. And I, we would be happy to share a copy of this because it is now out in print and we have a nice um, uh, formatted version of this. So um, we please let us know and we would be happy to send you a copy if you would like to read more about some of the ways that these data are used. And at this point, I'm gonna hand the microphone over to Erin because she's going to speak about some of the other innovations um, that have been taking place. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so I wanted to start out with just some kudos to our, well, it looks like our <laughs> the local phonology program, this should say programs there. But we, uh, we have a number of these programs across the country, and I think I recognize many of the names on the webinar today as members of these efforts. And uh, we are just so grateful for you all for your contributions to these programs. Uh, we, of course, love our individual Nature's Notebook observers as well. Um, but these programs are generally um, started by organizations or groups of people that come together with a phonology question or a kind of a goal that they have that they're trying to meet through Nature's Notebook. And this year we have over 200 of these programs, which I think is the most we've ever had. Um, and these programs really are really wonderful for data quality. You know, all of you that are local phonology leaders out there, you do a wonderful job of training your observers and making sure that they have access to all the materials that they need. Um, and then bring in a lot of data because you're able to have multiple observers um, tracking the same plants or at the same sites. And so the average number of observations for these programs is um, over 7,500, which is amazing. Uh, we also have a couple stats here on the average number of observers for these programs is just a little over eight. And the average number of sites is um, 3.7. So 
it's a, a really great amount of data that are coming in from these programs and we just um, really appreciate you all and we're just really interested to see what you all are learning too to help answer the questions that you have. So you want to go to the next slide. I also wanted to touch on our Nature's Notebook campaigns and share some stats on where we're at with these this year. Um, if you're not familiar with our Nature's Notebook campaigns, I invite you to check out this website. It has a list of all the 10 campaigns we're running this year. And so you can read a little bit more about them um, and how you can get involved, whether it's one that has species in your area. Um, but basically these are efforts that are focused on particular species that are of interest either to researchers or natural resource managers. And um, the nice thing about being part of these campaigns is you know that your data are going to be used. You don't have to you know, worry or wonder, or is a researcher going to come up with a question that would use the data that I'm collecting? Um, you can be assured that all the data that you're reporting are gonna be very useful um, to these researchers. So I wanted to run through um, each of these just really briefly um, to kind of let you know um, what's, what are the species that are involved with the campaign and then um, kind of give a shout out to some of our top contributing local phenology programs that are, are contributing to these campaigns. So one of our new campaigns this year is the Redbud Phenology Project. This is um, a, exclusive to the Eastern Redbud tree. Um, we're potentially gonna add on the Western Redbud tree. We had that requested this year. So it could be we can expand this project to the Western part of the country as well. Um, but we had a lot of data come in this year for a, a new project that's kind of more regional and focused. We had 41,000 records and 238 observers. This is thanks to our collaborator, Dr. Jorge Santiago Bly, who did a lot of outreach at the beginning of the year to help recruit people to this. And so hopefully some of you see your, your LPL um, or LPP names here um, as top contributors. You want to go to the next one? Um, we also have Quercus Quest is another new campaign this year. This is an effort that's focused on a number of oaks. This is a collaboration with a whole bunch of different researchers. It's part of a big NSF project, uh, biodiversity project, uh, collaborators with the Morton Arboretum and a, a number of universities and federal partners. Um, and the purpose of this campaign, it's, it's very complex, but we're trying to figure out how phenology is kind of linked up to hybridization in oaks, as well as um, different um, symbiotic organisms like fungi and galls caused by um, insects. And so you can see the, the species that are of interest for this campaign on the right. Uh, we had a lot of records already this year too, 61,000, uh, over 200 observers. And then a number of, you might see some of the same names on this um, list here too, some of our top contributing LPPs. All right, so the next one, this is one of our longest running campaigns, the Green Wave campaign. And this actually includes all of the maples, oaks, and poplars on our nature notebook list. So there are um, dozens of species on this list, so I didn't list them all here. And you can see that's kind of reflected in the number of observations. We have over 400,000 observations that have come in. Um, and I think um, 13, over 1,300 observers that have contributed. So I think it's something like over half of our data coming in are part of this campaign, because it just includes so many species. Um, and some of our most commonly observed species like red maple and sugar maple. Um, and you can see some of our, our top contributing LPPs on here as well. The next one. Um, so the next one is another campaign that's been running actually since the 50s, really, if you go back to our um, cloned lilac um, effort that began a long, long time ago. Um, this includes a, a number of species of lilacs and dogwoods. We have um, the cloned lilac as well as uh, the common lilac that are part of this campaign. And we also added on um, the dogwood species that are kind of allow us to expand this effort to southern areas where lilacs don't really grow. Um, and this effort, you know, is really looking at leafing and flowering of these species and how that might be different across different areas. Um, and adding to this really long-term data set that we have used in our spring maps that you might have seen, um, as well as other products. Um, so we have quite a few observations, over 50,000, um, over 500 observers contributing to this one. And then Nectar Connectors, um, we've been running for several years now. This is another national campaign. So if you're not involved in a campaign yet, this is a good one to check out because you likely have one of these species near you. Um, it includes 53 species of plants that are important for monarchs as well as other pollinators. And we're interested in the flowering that's happening with these species. 
So um, this is something that's of great interest for people that are concerned about monarchs, um, but also other pollinators as well. And we have over 300 people contributing, um, lots of records coming in from our LPPs as well. This is uh, one of our more local campaigns. This one is focused on um, areas that are used by the lesser longnose bat, mostly um, Southern Arizona, a little bit of New Mexico, um, when the lesser longnose bat is up in this area um, in the spring, summer, and fall. And we're interested in when nectar resources are available for this bat. And so we have a number of agave and columnar cacti on this list. Um, we have quite a few records still, even though it's a local campaign, over 12,077 observers and a number of um, our LPPs that are active in Tucson and Phoenix and a couple places in between as well. And then Pesky Plant Trackers was a campaign we started just last year. This is in collaboration with um, University of Minnesota researchers. Um, and what they're trying to do is um, have more information about when invasive species, including wild parsnip and a couple species of knotweed are um, leafing out and flowering and going to seed to help to um, have more effective management of those species. So trying to figure out, can we link up the amount of accumulated heat with these um, phenology um, phases of these species to try to create better um, kind of predictions for people that are going out to, to treat these species. And so we have a lot of, um, we have 65 individual observers um, and we have one um, LPP that's contributing um, that's actually linked up with the University of Minnesota and then um, Oak Hill Phenology as well. So thank you so much for contributing. Um, pest Patrol is another one. This is actually linked up with our pheno forecast, which some of you might have seen. These are forecasts of um, phenology activity of pest species, things like emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, I saw there was at least one person doing HWA that's here today. Um, and so we have a, the ability not only to see when we predict those species will be active, but also um, we have the ability for you to report in Nature's Notebook when you see these species and what phase they're in. So um, if you have any of these species that you, you have near you, I invite you to uh, take part in this campaign. You can sign up to get those notifications on when we predict that these species will be active, um, and then you can report on what you see near you. And then pollen trackers is a, another campaign that's a little more local. This was a, an effort with a researcher, Dan Katz, at the University of Texas at Austin, and we've been running it for the last few years. We are considering expanding this to be more of a national campaign focused on pollen. This is an area that we're, we have heard a lot of interest in. Um, you might have heard a lot in the news about how um, allergy season is getting earlier, getting longer, getting worse. And so phenology data can be really useful for that. Um, this campaign in particular has been focused on juniper trees in Texas. And so we had um, uh, over almost 10,000 records um, this year from that campaign um, with a, a number of people contributing and um, focused mostly on ash and juniper, but we're also interested in um, red cedar as well. And hopefully we'll be expanding this in the future. Um, and then lastly, um, Mayfly Watch, which is kind of a more local campaign as well. This is focused on um, emergences of um, may mayfly species along the upper Mississippi River. And um, we're really interested in, in when these giant emergences happen. Sometimes it includes millions of mayflies um, and they, there can be a lot of impacts on roads. A lot of times these mayflies will congregate near lights um, at gas stations and then cause a, a hazard by creating really slick roadways. So we're interested in having people track um, we haven't had a, a lot of LPPs contribute, but we're grateful to the Old Women Creek uh, National Estuary Research Reserve for contributing. Um, and I also just wanted to mention um, a couple other projects that we have going on in case um, you are in one of these locations. So a couple opportunities for folks in Arizona. We're launching uh, Desert Refuge, which is a new project in collaboration with the Desert Botanical Garden and funded by Monarch Joint Venture. Um, that's starting up looking at um, the phenology of milkweeds as well as monarchs and trying to figure out what's going on with these monarchs here in Arizona. They're kind of a, a funny population where we're not sure how many of them stay here versus migrate out to other locations for the winter. Um, and we're trying to get more of a sense of, of what's going on with their phenology. Um, and then we also have our buffalo grass effort, which we're trying to um, figure out the timing in between when buffalo grass is green enough to spray with herbicide um, until it goes to seed. 
So that's an effort that'll be um, ongoing again, probably next year. Um, we're also interested in how long buffalo grass stays green this fall. And then if you live in the South Central region, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, or Louisiana, we have an effort called Time to Restore that's focused on trying to give guidance to people who are doing pollinator restoration about what to plant, um, taking into consideration changes in climate that are going to be happening. So um, if you have um, interest in any of these, I'd be happy to share. You can put it in the chat or reach out. We'll have our emails at the end of the slideshow here. You can reach out with more information. All right, I also wanted to let you all know, um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware, we are working on a brand new website that is actually going to be a combination of our Nature's Notebook and NPN websites. We have a lot of new features um, as well as just looking more streamlined and being more easy to navigate. Uh, we have a bunch of new features we're very excited about with this new website. Um, one is something that all of our LPLs and LPP members have been requesting for a very long time is a map where you can actually see where are the local phenology programs across the country and then be able to more easily link up with other people in your area. And so this will allow you to kind of, um, you know, get in contact with people near you. You can maybe combine forces on trainings, things like that. Um, and then also for people who maybe don't have a local phenology program, they can reach out to you and say, hey, I'm in your area. I really want to get involved with your program. So that's going to be a, a really great new tool that we'll have on there. Um, we also have uh, our volunteer engagement coordinator, Samantha Brewer, who a lot of you know, um, is worked really hard on streamlining our education resources. So we're going to have a really nice new streamlined suite of resources for you all to use. Um, we're also improving the program planning process we have where you would request a local phenology program and then work through um, kind of all the resources we have for planning out your long term program. Um, that's going to be streamlined and updated. We're also updating resources like our FAQ page and making that searchable and a lot easier to use. Um, and another feature we're looking at for the coming months is um, the ability to send text messages um, at, for reminders for you all for Nature's Notebook. So we have another poll question that um, I will launch. And basically what I'm interested in um, hearing about is, are you interested if we were to um, have an option for you, it would be to opt in, of course, to um, receiving text messages um, that would have some sort of a reminder to observe. Um, I'd love to hear just to kind of gauge interest in this. I know some people don't want more text messages. You get a lot of them, um, but just to kind of figure out what percentage of folks would be interested um, in signing up. We won't, of course, ever send out without asking your permission, but um, would you be interested in opting into something like this? And to reiterate again, if even if you did opt into it, if we offered it and you opted in, you would always have the option to opt back out. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And the reminder would be just about going out and making observations or about some of these meetings or? That's a great question. So I think we would probably start off with a reminder to observe kind of thing, but we could also have um, other types of things like um, information about a webinar or, you know, other opportunities, um, a new campaign or something like that. And we would probably give preferences um, where you could opt into different types of messages. But yeah, thanks for that question. So it looks like um, about, yeah, half, half the people said yes and half said no. So that is helpful. Thank you. Um, I have one more question that is about it for those folks who do want reminders. Um, what's your ideal frequency? Would you be interested in weekly? Um, that's like on a day that we kind of randomly select right now we have um, reminders that you can opt into on your observation deck where they go out on Wednesdays because that seemed like kind of a compromise day. Um, but would you be interested in that or weekly on a day that you choose more often than weekly or less often? Um, and if you are interested, you can just skip this question. All right, so it looks like most people say weekly or weekly on a day that they choose. So share that. So thank you for that um, input. That's really helpful for us in our planning as we go forward. All right, I think we have one more slide or is that our last slide? We have, uh, that's a good question. Let's find out. <laughs> oh yes, okay. So um, I also wanted to draw attention to, um, if you haven't seen it, we have this really nice, beautiful um, milestone tracker on our Nature's Notebook homepage. 
Uh, we do have a goal of trying to get to 4 million phenology records this year in Nature's Notebook. Uh, we've gotten pretty close to this in past years, but we've never quite gotten there. So that's our goal for this year. And we're not quite there yet. We're not really on track um, to getting there, but we're hoping that with kind of this fall um, coming up with a lot of um, interesting things to track with colored leaves and um, senescence of plants and, and things like that, maybe some fruit reports, um, maybe migrating birds as they migrate fall, um, down south in the fall, um, that will get a little bump in observation. So if you can, you know, put in a couple more observations or share nature's topic with a friend uh, to help us get to 4 million records, we would really appreciate it. And, ah, yes, so we also, um, we always like to tell people about our local phenology leader certification course. So this is a course that we offer every fall and spring. Um, we have a lot of people that are in it this fall, so we're really excited that's gonna start up next week. But we will also have a course in the springtime and we're also exploring a self-paced version. So I invite you to visit the LPL certification webpage. We can put it in the chat as well um, and get on the interest list because we'll be sending out, um, once we open up the course in the springtime, um, we'll be sending out information to that list. All right, so just another huge thank you to you all for all that you do for collecting data in Nature's Notebook, um, all of you local phenology leaders out there that are managing your programs and doing just such a great job of engaging with your volunteers. We really appreciate all of your efforts. Um, I don't know if Teresa, if you wanna say any other thank yous. That's, that's basically it. <laughs> just we're so grateful for everybody's continued participation and and that's the, how we're able to sustain. Awesome. So yeah, at this point, we are happy to take questions. And it looks like there are several in the chat. Um, I've had the fortune to be able to cruise through these while Erin was talking. So I will answer the first one, at least. There was, going back to the uh, study that looked at the impact of artificial light, someone asked whether, um, they considered LED versus uh, um, conventional. What type are those called? I'm, I'm having a hard time with words today. I did have COVID over the summer. I blame that. Um, yes, they did. Um, the more standard conventional light bulbs, um, I think, has been has been indicated here, is more full spectrum, and so you have all the different wavelengths um, represented, or or more of more so of that represented in those in those lights. Whereas with LEDs, you probably know from all of the concern about um, good bone hygiene and getting to sleep at night, they tend to admit more in the blue spectrum. Um, blue is bad for us; it interrupts our sleep um, and our ability for our brains to shut down. It's actually red and infrared that is the most problematic for plants in this case, or, or like, that they're most sensitive to. Um, the, the, the longer wavelengths, which is what, what the red and infrared are, is, is what plants are sensitive to and helps them get going in the spring. And so there have been um, lots of experiments where uh, researchers have given plants just a flash of red or even infrared light in the middle of the night and totally messes with them. Um, it depends on whether they're considered short day plants or long day plants, meaning how much daylight, daylight or darkness do they need to stay either dormant or, or um, to be more active and to know, basically know what season it is. The study did take that into effect to some extent and they definitely noted that um, in the case where there's more prevalence of um, the conventional light bulbs that have more of that, that uh, uh, red and infrared wavelengths presence, present, that definitely has a stronger impact on the plant's phenology. And so the recommendation is if we can move toward the light bulbs that are shorter wavelength in nature, it will have hopefully less of an impact on plants and phenology. And as a side note, I know for sure, but I didn't review these papers before this um, webinar, that there's been a lot of research that have looked at the impacts of artificial light on insects and migratory birds and other species too, they're all getting really disrupted by all this light. And it would be very cool and interesting to know, again, whether the, the light bulb type and the wavelengths present, present, um, present in that light matters. And I, I don't know, but it's definitely something that would be interesting to follow up on. 
Erin, I'm going to pass one to you. Maybe we'll take turns. Someone yeah. asked, can you, um, let's see, I'm having trouble recording some of my Lilac Bud profiles. Do you have a handbook for data entry? So we do have a observer certification course, um, which is kind of taking the place of, we used to have the how to observe handbook. We still have this as a PDF, but it's become a little bit updated. So I would definitely recommend checking out the observer certification course. Um, once you log into your observation deck, it'll be the first thing right there at the top, but also put the direct link. It's um, learning.usampn.org. Um, and that will really walk you through those five modules as part of that. The, the first module goes through the basics and that will include how to enter data and edit data. So that's probably the best place to start. And there are some videos in the course as well that will walk you through how to do that. Excellent. Thanks, Erin. Let's see, there's a lot of questions on here. Um, if, if we're almost at the top of the hour, so if you need to leave, that's fine. I'm happy to stay on and, and keep answering questions though, uh, for those of you that are interested. I'll take one here. Someone asked, have Thoreau's records on plants in Massachusetts been incorporated into our databases? So yeah, maybe not everybody knows that Henry David Thoreau actually documented a lot of phenology back in the mid 1800s uh, at his um, Walden Pond in, um, in particular, but in the whole kind of Boston area, Concord area. And those data have become really pretty famous because they were one of the first historical data sets to be digitized and then compare it against contemporary records. Um, there was a paper published uh, back in 2008 that is, it was really one of the seminal papers that did that, that activity showing how leaf out and flowering timing has changed since the 1800s. And the answer to your question is no. Um, Thoreau's records were collected in a little bit different way than the Nature's Notebook protocols ask, us, ask you to document things. And at this time, we, we don't really have uh, the capacity to bring together data sets that have been collected in different ways like this. However, we, there's research actively happening that's moving in that direction. And what's really exciting is that in the next few years, we should be able to ingest far more historical data sets along these lines and dramatically expand the availability of phenology data to support the kinds of research like, like I showed in that first study from New York. Um, so yeah. I'll stop there so that we can fit in as much as we can, but it's pretty exciting to finally be able to bring together historical and contemporary data with um, more ease. Yeah, we had another question about the app um, and whether the app was gonna be updated. Um, and there was kind of a related question, I think that was um, to do with seeing other people's observations. So I know this is something, especially for the local phenology programs where you wanna be able to see what someone else in your program observed last week, or even like more easily see past observations. So we did update the app about a year ago to have a review screen and not everyone knows about this. So I just wanted to mention it, but when you're on the app, there's a series of menus at the top. And if you scroll over to the right, there's a review screen and a calendar. And you can actually use that to see at least what you yourself reported on the app in previous weeks. Um, and you can actually, if you need to edit things, you can do it there. So I just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. Um, we are aware that uh, a lot of people would like to be able to see other people in their group as well. And right now the app only works one direction where it sends observations into the database, but it doesn't pull it. So it can't pull other observations from your group, but it's something that we're aware of. So, um, you know, it's on our list to try to look at for a future version. Um, but the ability to enter a comment um, should be there. So I will look at that specific, um, question there about the Android app and just make sure that that's working right. Um, but yes, we, we do have a list of things we're hoping to update on the app um, in the next version. Uh, there was a question about the dates for the spring LPL course. I don't think those dates have been set just yet, but as soon as they are, we will get that information shared out and posted on that website. And if you're interested now, you can go ahead and let us know. We can get you on a list. Erin, do we have, is that form? Standing? Yeah, so the, there is an interest list button on the, the page that I posted, the LPL certification page. So just go there and look for the interest list. And then once you're on there, we'll send out updates. There's, there's one more um, uh, philosophical question here of our decision-making process for including a new species of pest. Um, yeah, we've we've had some definitely had some feedback on the use of that term and have tried to back away from it in the cases where um, an insect is not necessarily 
a pest, or even if it's, it, it is kind of pesty in certain applications, but is native um, because <clears throat> generally pests are something that are perceived to be problematic. Um, so yeah, we're trying to be a little more cautious and inclusive in our language, but I don't think that we've gotten everything changed in all the places just yet. Um, regarding whether, whether and how we add different species, um, that's a lot driven by stakeholder needs and interests. Um, we have, in Nature's Notebook, there's over 1600 species of, of plants and animals available for observing, but there's always the opportunity to make recommendations or suggestions if there are species that you have interest in tracking. <clears throat> and especially if you are interested because having data for that species would, would help you either in your work or um, in decision-making. And so a lot of what we have and the products that we have are driven by <clears throat> stakeholder needs and end user needs. So we're, we're listening and open to suggestions along those lines. Um, and then a, a related question about um, if we will add spotted lanternfly. Um, we do have that actually on our list ready for observations. We don't yet have a pheno forecast, but we are developing one um, in collaboration with some researchers at Oregon State. And so we will have that next year. Yeah, there's a question. Do we have definitions for exotic, invasive, native, naturalized? Um, <clears throat> that's a little, that's not necessarily our expertise. I think we tend to defer to how other organizations make those, those uh, put those labels. And we're not, you know, we're not even super attached to any particular label. More than anything, our interest is in collecting, storing, and sharing data for a different species. And so, yeah, I think when we even put labels on species, it's where we kind of sometimes get feedback that maybe that's not, not everybody recognizes species in that particular way. So um, yeah, I'm gonna defer on that one <laughs> because our business is phenology and less on putting species into categories really. And then a specific question about the mayflies, um, how the data are gonna be used for that. Um, yeah, so it's actually, it's interesting. The main management application is um, predicting when the emergencies will happen and then turning the lights off on the bridges. So it's not really so much managing the pests themselves, but, um, or the mayflies themselves, but um, just knowing like when we can prevent um, the congregations happening under the lights and then prevent the, the streets from becoming slick and causing accidents. Um, mayflies are actually really beneficial. And um, another reason they're interested in the emergences is knowing, you know, when is there going to be a lot of food available for fish and for other animals. So, um, yeah. Erin, we received one question, one request for a refresher on how to submit data. And I'm wondering, beyond the observer certification course that you mentioned, is there any other resource that you might uh, suggest? Um, because that really is a webinar all by itself, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's really where we're trying to channel people right now, because that's like the most up to date. Um, and I would just say, you know, there are um, probably six hours worth of modules on the observer certification course, but the first one will really give you the overview. And that one we estimate only takes 45 minutes. So that's where I would start. Um, I can also put um, a link to our, if you prefer videos, uh, our YouTube channel, we have a how-to playlist. So if you go through those, those are also in the server certification course, but that will kind of provide um, an overview. And then finally, someone asked, do you have a project or species search based on zip code? Is oh, the zip code on the species search page? I think it's just no, state, it's, right? Uh, yeah, state, um, but project, yeah, project search, that's interesting, like for campaigns or something. Um, yeah, for campaigns, yeah. we have um, maps for each individual campaign that you can look at and see if the range of the species is in your area. Um, but yeah, we don't have zip code. Um, I think because the information um, at the species profile level is at the state level, we don't have fine grain enough to go to zip code. Um, but that's an interesting thought. We'll put it okay. on the list. I think we got them all. I think we got all the questions. Yeah, hopefully we didn't miss any, but our email addresses are there too. So we are always happy to hear from you too. Um, and thank you again for your attendance today and your great questions and conversations and all the participating.
please let us know what else we can do for you. Yes, thank you. All right, so you stop the recording now. Okay, try.